Hi! Happy New Year! My name is Shannon and I am coming to you from Northern New Jersey. This is my Knitter's Life series. Second season? First episode? <laughs> welcome! Welcome! Welcome to my little corner of YouTube. I, um, I noticed that there's a few new viewers, so I thought I would take a couple minutes and just share with you um, who I am and because uh, maybe maybe also I don't know if I've ever done a really good recap of who I am and you probably pick up tidbits here and there and I know uh, I know I know for myself like when I'm watching a new channel I sometimes do a little digging if I'm curious about the person I might do some digging into their past episodes to try to figure it out so I thought I would just put it all right here in case you're new here or maybe you just found me in the last month or two I seem to have gotten quite a few viewers um, uh, just after the Rhinebeck episode and I mean I was kind of getting a slow build and then the Rhinebeck episode and then um, some of my vlogmases so maybe you've joined since I started to do vlogmases which is great thank you um, welcome I'm so happy you're here I'm so excited to share with you um, my knitting and spinning journey chiefly I do sometimes crochet and I occasionally sew I usually tend to sew in the spring summer months um, and then I'll make one or two projects and I lose steam um, I, I don't I already have a really fairly big wardrobe so um, usually I'm just looking to add one or two special pieces um, and yeah that's it so I want to um, begin by telling you I think I've said I'm I live and work in northern New Jersey so professionally I am a university administrator and instructor um, I work for uh, a department that is it's the work uh, centers around family studies um, and and like I like to say families are ubiquitous and uh, so you can find them in every aspect of society so basically we are studying everything but through the lens of the family um, so that is that is uh, my day job um, that I make money that way I have I make a very good living and I um, am doing this channel because it gives me a sense of community so I am doing it for the community building that uh, I I have here and I you know meeting like-minded people I've met many um, new friends in the past few years that I've been um, doing this recording and uh, yeah, it's been really, really amazing. I enjoy sharing with you my projects so much. Um, and that, that's the only reason I'm doing it, just for that community. I'm not here to try to turn this into a, a money-making gig. Oh, I, <laughs> this will help you understand. I do design, I have some background, which I'm gonna share in a minute. I do design patterns and uh, stuff. So I have my own designs and you're gonna see, I have um, yarn sitting over there on the bed um, that I'm planning to make one of my designs, a design that I published a couple years back. Um, a design, I have a, uh, it's called Rye Laring Tea, so it's a really simple, basic um, crew neck, or you can you can make a button, like a Henley um, collar if you wanted. Very, very simple pattern, but I've made like seven or eight of them, and I wear, I wear them a lot. I wear them in the summer, like all the different, because you can do sleeveless, short sleeve, long sleeve, um, and I have a couple of them planned this year. So anyway, uh, I do design patterns, but I wanted to share with you that I had my very best design month in terms of the amount of money I made in December of 2021. And I made a whole big $50. <laughs> so I'm not in this, I'm not making, I'm making patterns for myself. And if, you know, and I publish patterns that I think other people will like. Um, and if you buy it, you buy it. And if you don't, you don't. There's no hard sell here. I'm not, there's no sponsored content. Everything is my own. Um, doing it for my own self. And yeah. So that's what you can look forward to here. No matter how big I get, I am not going to ever do this to make a buck. To make some money. I don't need it for that. I have a very good job that I love. And um, yeah. 
So, so just FYI, and if you do ever watch commercials, it's because YouTube put them in, not because I put them in. Um, hopefully there's no commercials in the middle um, ever, because I hate that myself when I'm watching. Um, but there won't be commercials. If there are commercials at the beginning, that's because YouTube put them in there for you. Um, they do that to me too. Like sometimes when I'm watching my own videos, just, you know, just checking to see if everything's looking good, they'll put commercials in, even though I haven't put them in. So just know all of that. Um, in terms of my knitting journey, I learned how to knit when I was 17. It was in that summer between high school and college. I had moved from LA. I grew up in Los Angeles and moved from LA to the East Coast to a very small rural area of upstate New York and uh, was going to college in that same area. And, you know, I'd never had my first winter and I wanted to learn how to knit. I had always been a pretty crafty person. My mother was a crafty person. My mom uh, professionally was a nurse and um, nurses tend to have some sort of creative outlet um, to help them de-stress and and they're also they also tend to be I shouldn't make generalizations right because I, I, I don't know but my mom was crafty and it seems to be something that a lot of nurses do <laughs> so my mom did all kinds of crafts and she went all in with one craft for you know a period of time a few months or a couple years and then dropped it and moved on to a new craft or whatever it was of the moment so she did all different types of things she sewed a lot she knit a lot she crocheted a lot she made stained glass stuff she did all kinds of she macrame she did quilting she just she never spun yarn um but she did all a whole bunch of other kind of crafty things so i was always surrounded by it um and uh, my my mom, my parents, my biological parents divorced. My mother remarried when I was young, and my stepfather was also a crafts person. He was like hardcore crafts, like made crafts and sold crafts for a living. So um, I was exposed to a lot of different crafts through that: woodworkers and jewelers and all kinds of different painters and all kinds of different people um, growing up. So, you know, it didn't occur to me that knitting would be hard or anything like that. It was just felt like something I should be able to do because I'd been sewing, I'd crocheted, I'd done all sorts of needlework, uh, quilted. Um, yeah, I'd done a lot of things. Embroidery, like crazy, cross stitch, all kinds of those, all of those things. Um, so I, Vogue Knitting Magazine was just back on the scene, maybe a couple years at that point, and I found it in the local grocery store, um, picked up an issue. My mother had this crafting book that talked about how to, how to knit. So I learned how to knit by reading that book and looking at Vogue Magazine. And um, my mother found a local farm yarn shop so like a farmer who had sheep who made the wool into yarn it was really coarse and harsh but you know it was cheap and I was a poor college student so I went ahead and knit some sweaters out of that like I learned taught myself I made about a scarf about that big and then stopped and made a sweater <laughs> so yeah, it was a crazy, crazy time. Um, sweaters were all, in this country anyway, were all bottom up knit in pieces. And um, I haven't knit like that in 30 years probably at this point because once I learned how to knit in the round, I, I, once I found Elizabeth Zimmerman, <laughs> that was it. I wasn't knitting, you know, I was um, not really knitting in pieces too much anymore. And I had circular needles. I had these old plastic circular needles. Nothing like what we have now. So yeah, I just kind of always knitted something. I always, you know, every winter, fall, winter, I would knit a thing or two. I wasn't like a lifestyle knitter like I am now. I didn't become a lifestyle knitter until I my sons moved out, um, grew up and moved out. Um, but I did spend many, many years, my very first career out of college, I was a fashion studies major. My first career out of college was knitwear design. Um, so I worked my way up from assistant to um, head knitwear designer, like moving around different companies. I worked for a very big company um, that 
eventually got absorbed by Liz Claiborne and um, I, in my last job as head knitwear designer, we made sweaters commercially in Brooklyn, in factories in Brooklyn and in Hong Kong. And uh, I would do some on-site development with the Brooklyn um, factories. And yeah, I was mostly, you know, doing a lot of design work. So a lot of sketching, a lot of swatching, um, a lot of like thumbing through Barber Walker's uh, knit stitch dictionaries and picking out stitches and showing it to mills and saying we want this stitch or buying sweaters cutting cutting a piece out of the sweater and mailing it off to Hong Kong asking them to duplicate it um, so yeah we did we did a lot of uh, you know that type of stuff a lot of conceptual work without doing I mean I once in a while would knit a swatch out of Barbara Walker's book just to send off to a, a mill to so that they could see if they could uh, figure out how to do it on the machines yeah it was it was fun it was it was fun to some degree but it was also pretty grueling like it was a not a very well paid position um, none of the garment industry workers make a lot of money Salespeople maybe, but all the other workers, nobody makes a lot of money in the garment industry. It's very, very, very grueling work. Um, and you start at bare bones, base bottom. You know, I barely made minimum wage. I, well, I made minimum wage, barely made over minimum wage at the start. Towards the end, I was making more, but it still wasn't a lot. Um, and I, w I became a mother in that period of time. And uh, I was married and then I became a single mother in that period of time, in that same 10 year period. And then I really, really wanted something that was more friendly to parenting, which is how I landed in academia. So I went back to school for both a um, degree in counseling and a degree in studio arts, an MFA, I have a master's in fine arts. And that allowed me to teach content in both of those areas, as well as my professional area, which was fashion. That's kind of how I ended up where I am now. The classes that I teach now is uh, our courses on um, feminism and how to interact with people you love. <laughs> so relationship classes. Um, those are primarily what I teach. It's funny, I have this book. Actually, I just picked up this book. It's called Follow the Flock by Sally Coulthart. It is how sheep shaped human civilization. Kind of hoping I might make a course proposal about teaching something um, that speaks to this topic, this idea of the history of sheep. So I may do that. I may um, write that proposal for the fashion studies folks and see if they're interested in something like that, like a history of textiles, um, but primarily wool textiles. So we'll see some of the things that are brewing so that's that's kind of the stuff that I do um, I love my work now I um, the administrative work that I do I'm primarily I'm not the chair of the department I work with the chair of the department very closely though we spend a lot of time strategizing um, problem solving um, I oversee the student services for our department so all of the student issues come somehow like I'm involved or uh, or I'm assisting someone else in coming up with a conclusion or something that we can, you know, way to help the students that, you know, come to us with problems. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, for the last two years, I've been largely remote. Um, I was 100% remote for about 18 months. And then we went back to a hybrid format, which, you know, so many other companies are doing. Like uh, we were... Um, back in the office for one day a week and then it moved to two and now we're up to three um, but I think with Omicron emerging we're back to fully remote at least for the short term and uh, we'll ease back into um, a more hybrid format again pretty pretty soon like when Omicron it seems like the threat of it is gone so yeah I just wanted to do a little quick update uh, I would normally next do a whiskey chat, but uh, this is going to be a very, very long episode. So I generally do a whiskey. This is whiskey and wool. So I generally do either a whiskey chat or a gin chat right here, um, right off the bat. It's usually about 10 minutes. Um, 
the next whiskey I want to do is a Japanese whiskey and I think it's going to take me a little time. I want a little more time to research that region and t and come to you with a really good succinct um, segment about that because I just have one Japanese whiskey in that whole whiskey advent that I have so I want to talk. I'm so excited to try it, but I want to do it due diligence. So that will come back in episode two. You will see a whiskey chat. Um, so I hope you're not too disappointed in that um, for those of you who really love it. So, and otherwise, you know, from this point, I am going to jump right in to the wool content. I should say too, I should say a couple things before I get into the knitting. One, I am wearing the stone crop cardigan. Uh, this one I made in, I don't know, 2019 or 2020. Um, maybe it was like the bridge between those two years because I bought the yarn at, uh, it's a non-superwash yarn that I bought from Ushutita. I'm not even sure if she's dying anymore. I don't see her. Uh, she could be. I just, she, for some reason, doesn't come up in my Instagram. Um, but yeah, I bought it at... Um, no, sorry, I didn't buy it at EYF, at Edinburgh Yarn Festival. 2019 I saw it there and did not buy it but I bought it after I got home it was one of those moments where I had seen some yarn and I had regrets about not buying because you get so overwhelmed when you go to yarn festivals especially when you go to yarn festivals that are quite far away and you're seeing new vendors and it could be very yeah you know you know what I'm talking about right <laughs> anyway I did a look back when I got home and ended up buying it um on my look back so yeah it's uh yeah so it's knit out of um some highland wool from ushushita i don't know if she has this anymore and um some spin cycle um stay out of the forest which was the um skein i i bought the spin cycle i think it was their first visit to rhinebeck they were at indie untangled and it had to have been it wasn't 2019. I didn't see, I did see them there, but I didn't, I didn't go to India Untangled that year. So maybe it was 2018 or 2017 that I, that I saw them and picked up this color. It was a brand new color that year. They still make it, but it's kind of these, um, autumnal, uh, oranges to reds to, um, yeah. So oranges to reds is probably a good way to put it. There's some, maybe some brown worked in there. But yeah, I love it. This is such a cozy cardigan. I have actually made a second stone crop since this one. My second one is burgundy toned and has um, uh, some gold uh, spin cycle that I used in it. But yeah, love it, love it, love it. Um, yeah, I should say that. I should tell you, actually, definitely tell you what I'm wearing. And then also say that normally right here, right in this space here my I usually have my mannequin Martha who is my size I have made her my size and I have a video somewhere in my archives where I talk about how to size your mannequin if you're interested in having your own mannequin fit you to a T um, she, yeah she's usually here but I have nothing for her to wear so I just didn't put her in the shot um, I am in the midst of a couple different whips and nothing is far enough along that I could actually put it on her so I just decided to leave her out and instead what you're seeing is um, some of my yarns and fiber that is waiting for me to either catalog it or put it away. <laughs> so kind of newish acquisitions most of which you've already seen. Yeah I think you've seen all that. All that everything that's back there. If you watched in any of my episodes in the last month or so, they're all I talked about all that. So yeah, that is uh, the story with where Martha is is not actually she's right in front of me, um, just not wearing anything. And yeah, and that is what I'm wearing. And uh, the only other thing I want to just mention is that we um, got some snow. And it's a really dreary day. It's very, very cold out. Um, very snowy. Not, it's not snowing right now, but I think we had some sleet earlier. And uh, yeah, we had it. We got about six and a half inches a couple days ago. And uh, yesterday it was bright and sunny and gorgeous. And it kind of melted some of it. Um, 
but yeah, um, tomorrow's supposed to be a high of like 12 or 14 Fahrenheit here. So it's going to be very, very cold and I am very grateful I get to work remotely. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, let's get into my projects, everything. Oh, I do have one FO. So maybe you were wondering if I was going to finish my New Year's Eve socks and I did, or my New Year's Day socks, I should say. I like to wear brand new socks on New Year's Day. I usually, this is, this. so 2021 was kind of the year of socks for me, um, which I'm going to talk about. I actually have a recap planned that I'm going to talk to you about um, after I do all my knits. And yeah, so it was the year of socks for me in terms of knitting. Like I ended up knitting socks and I had not really, I dabbled in knitting socks, but I realized that there was quite a lot to learn in terms of getting socks that would fit. Um, so I didn't really have the bandwidth to look at that, to dig into that um, with any sort of, um, you know, concentration where I would retain the information until this past year. So I, I delved into sock knitting and I've actually worn these. So these are a little more stretched out, but um, I ended up making these socks um, these are the DRK everyday sock pattern and I bought a six skein mini skein set from Wooly Mammoth because I immediately became very interested in non-nylon socks um, just for the more cozy. I was making socks out of my hand spun this year and stuff which was really really fun um, and they're so comfortable um, but this pair I've knit out of Woolly Mammoth uh, sock yarn. It's a four ply sock yarn. So Woolly Mammoth, if you're not familiar, is a indie yarn dyer who lives in Northern Ireland and she is a natural dyer. So she's um, about no nylon yarns and she does a lot of limited edition yarns that are really, you know, local, all this local, local, local to her area. and I. Yeah, so I had a mini skein set, six, six skein mini six skein set. I took three of those skeins and divided it so you can kind of see there's a line. My thought was that I would make it like a gradient. So it ends up being like a purple foot with a creamy, um, slightly purpled speckled um, top of the sock. So yeah, so I have another three skeins. I divided each of those three skeins in half. And so I have another three skeins that I can make another pair of socks. It, um, but yeah, I finished these just in time. Actually finished them on New Year's Day that morning and um, wore them, <laughs> cast off and wore them and then washed and blocked them and have since worn them again. They're so comfortable. I love this yarn. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more of Emma's yarn in the future. Um, she is on maternity leave right now, and I don't think her next shop update is going to be until the end of February or thereabouts. Um, but follow her on um, Instagram and sign up for her newsletter, and yeah, you'll be in the know. That's the best way, because her yarn sells out instantly. It's one of those, or it's small quantities, instantly sells out. So yeah, that is my one FO, and everything else you're gonna see from here on in are whips. So I want to um, start with the one of my advent knits. I have two advent knits here. Um, so I'm gonna start with one of my advent knits and I'm going to, I did film a little update of it. Um, and this will be, this clip that you're about to watch is going to be a bit of a continuation if you watch my Vlogmases. But when you come back from that clip, I will um, update you, I'll fill you in in case you didn't watch Vlogmases, it's fine. I made it to day 11. Oh my God, this part right here, it's so pretty, but man, it was really a bear to knit. It, actually, I made a mistake right here, somewhere around in the round. I mean, it's a, it's a eight stitch repeat and every row you do something different. It's a different set of stitches, a different set of like knits and pearls that you do. And there, it must have been like every three or four rounds that I made some mistake and I had to rip back. Um, yeah, but I've been obsessively knitting 
this, um, <laughs> this shawl, even though I really should be working on my socks. I don't think I'm going to get my socks done by New Year's Day, but that's okay. That is okay. I'm okay with that. I'll wear one sock. I'll have one new sock. <laughs> okay, so you saw where I was at in day 11. So here, here's the, the, um, let me just show you this and then I'll, talk to you about it as you look at it. So here's where I'm at. I'm working on the applied border section of this pattern, which is day, starts with day 16. Um, so here's the piece. It's a round shawl, blanket, something with the center being right in, see that? You start in the, start right here, right here and knit in the round out um, progress and you get progressively bigger. So that small pink um, section with the eyelets, that was day one. So the way that Olan did this, and it was actually pretty interesting, she did a recap, um, she sent a recap email yesterday where she talked about what happened on her side and it was quite a lot of uh, work, which, you know, it's work that they do so but I mean it, some of the numbers were overwhelming to me um so yeah the way she did it was every day you were opening a uh, 20 gram mini skein of either her indie dyed sock yarn or her um, four ply uh, fingering weight mill yarn so a uh, 20 gram skein of each and the, I think the mill yarn I came, came to the conclusion that I think the mill yarn is slightly less yardage than her sock yarn um, and so each day she was it was a mystery cow <laughs> it was mystery knit along each day you were opening a skein and you got a clue so there was all this knitting to do um, and um, one of the things that I came to appreciate was that pretty much each clue you were using up the entire mini skein so you weren't like knitting a bit and then you know having like 10 grams or five grams left it was almost everything like maybe you had a yard or two left um so I quickly fell behind because it was a lot more knitting than I could handle especially with so much of the gift knitting I was doing um and she also had a theme to this pattern so um, there was a knit and a crochet so if you were a crocheter you could have done the crochet pattern instead um, and I just, I prefer to knit, even though I can crochet. Um, yeah, so I quickly fell behind because I just couldn't, I couldn't manage, uh, the amount of knitting. And the knitting was also, I think I can safely say it was rarely mindless. So it wasn't, this wasn't a, a calm, relaxing n knit. It was a knit where you had to be on it. And paying attention and um, you know following charts frequently following charts doing something different every single row knitting two colors at a time sometimes um, knitting texture quite a lot and yeah so it was it, it pretty intense um, but enjoyable um, I, I was obsessed with it for a while and some of the knitting other knitting that I had planned to do fell by the wayside um, but I've sort of slowed down lately just because uh, when I got to the applied border so now I'm knitting this is day 15 and 16 I'm knitting um, two colors which I think you can see better on this side so I'm alternating she had us I'll open a mill skein alternating with a indie dyed skein her own indie dyed um, and yeah, so, uh, in this particular case, I do, I, you know, I'm knitting, it's an applied border that you're knitting this way. So you're knitting back and forth just across, I think is about 20 stitches and then you're attaching it. So when you come this way, you're knitting two stitches together, one from the shawl or blanket and one from the border. So it ends up, you know, looking like that attached. And there's like a slip stitch pattern in here. So yeah, you do this all the way around. And um, when I got to this part, 
um, I could see that it was going to take quite a while <laughs> to knit up both of those skeins. And then um, what she has you do is you slowly, you're working in sort of this gradient. Let's see if I have them here so I can show you. Um, yeah, so these are the two colors I'm working with right now. This one's beautiful. I actually really love both of these. And then, so then you go from there to, I think you actually go to these two, and then these two. So you can see that it'll get progressively darker as I go around. So these will all be in that applied border. I'm gonna need all of them. Um, and then after that, you do, you go all the way around and pick up about 600 stitches and then you knit um, in the round again um, and you make another border that's about this long. And in that, and the way that the shawl was designed, it's genius. I mean, you're using up every bit of your yarn. So she has you, we got a full skein of um, sock weight, indie dyed sock weight from her. We use that mostly, but there's, opportunity to incorporate all the other yarns that you still have left in your knit bag and I don't have much um there's very little um but yeah so I'm excited for that part too um I think that pattern is that texture that bit of texture is going to be the most mindless as far as I can tell I don't think there's any charts I think it's just a textured where you're alternating knits and pearls in some way um but yeah, I mean, as I said in that clip, this part, though it's so pretty, it was really, really, it was such, these Vs, they're so nice, but it was so boring after a while. It was just so boring. It was, it was, it was a slog. Um, but yeah, so that's where I'm at with this. I, I don't know how quickly I'm going to get that done. It's very pretty. I'm excited to, um, I'm excited to make it all the way around that border so I can get a sense of how big it is because I'm not really sure I quite grasp how big it is. And uh, yeah, I, I wanna see how it looks. It's gonna be like, I mean, I have a guest room. This is a guest room in a way right back over here. This is actually this quilt that you're seeing. This was made by my aunt so long ago, the same one that taught me how to crochet. And uh, it's made out of all old jeans. It's really, really sturdy and very, very warm. And I'm so grateful that she <laughs> let me have it. And it was really, uh, she let me have it because she had left it at my parents' house and I took it for some reason. And yeah, I've had it for a while. And she, she knows, she knows I have it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I have this guest bed, but I, I don't really think the colors go with it. So maybe in a future, guest room or maybe on my own bed it might look nice um but yeah we'll we'll see see what I end up doing I may gift it to someone we'll see so yeah that was my one advent knit and I have a uh second advent this was another I had two 24 day advents so the Olan was a 24 day and the treats and things that she put in there was fantastic. I think I talked more about my Advents in my very last Vlogmas. So if you really want to know more details on my Advents and Vlogmas 5, I, I kind of recapped them. Um, so yeah, this is my other Advent, my other 24 day. This is um, a scrappy half and half triangle wrap by... Uh, that's what the pattern is by Pearl Soho, which I'll put a picture on screen of what this looks like. It is a shawl slash blanket. Um, mine is being made out of cashmere treats, 24 day DK weight, 100% cashmere yarn. And I, my, I had this idea when, after I had ordered the um, advent, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with the 24 mini skeins, but I thought this might be I came to the conclusion that this might be a fun thing to do um, somewhere around like, I don't know, September or so. And I think I talked about it, but um, so the way that I'm knitting this is I, um, I just, I came up with this random repeat and the red is actually a mini skein from last year that I never used. I had gotten the 12 day mini skein set from, mini skein advent from Cashmere Treats 
for Christmas 2020. And I made a project. Um, I made a striped sweater. And I ended up... Um, I love it. It's so comfy. I ended up buying a couple full skeins to help me get like a... Um, a collection of colors that I really really like together and in this case I have a couple full skeins incorporated in here so this speckly one is a full skein I actually have two and a half full skeins of this um, I had the red left over from last year but otherwise all the other colors oh and this pink this speckly pink is also another full skein I had um, all the other colors you're seeing are my advent colors um, beginning with day one right here, then day two is here. The yellow was a little extra I had from last year. This is day three, day four, day five, and day six. So I decided to put the, the mini skeins in um, collections of six colors. So this is day uh, seven through 12. And... Um, and, and then also I have these. These are my last six, six days. So I just put them in bags of six colors a piece. And my, my thought was I'm gonna knit in some sort of random stripe pattern one, uh, two, two or three times, depending on where I'm at on the shawl of how many I can get in and repeat it until those colors are gone. And there is a little bit of like dribs of, um, colors where I ended up having to change mid row, but you really can't tell, I think with this pattern. Um, yeah, I, it's funny after I, I got to, I was in this part here and I was watching big little yarn company, uh, cozy cardigans, uh, channel, YouTube channel. And, um, Mel is making a, from her mini skein sets, she's making the uh, DAA cardigan by Isabel Kramer, which is a stripe cardigan, but she's using all her mini skeins. So uh, Isabel Kramer's is with two colors, so alternating two colors. So she's knitting all her mini skeins in a in a set, or, I mean, I, not really set pattern, but like where she's using like a whole bunch of them, like 20 of them. And so she's doing like this 20 stripe repeat for the cardigans. She'll probably get two repeats out. And I was thinking to myself, I should have done something like that where I was doing like a set number of rows. So I think she's doing four rows and then she changes colors. I should have done something like that where I did like two garter ridges and then changed instead of doing like this random. Yeah, I just was nervous and I still am a little nervous about running out of yarn. <laughs> So that was why I divided out of the 24, 12 skeins for one side, 12 skeins for the other. Also, they made different story colors or color stories. So um, days one through six were sort of this like terracotta to pink. And then day six to 12 is like um, the continuation of pink, like deeper, more intense pinks to uh, lavender. And then I think day the next six days are like blue tones. Yeah, here they are. Blues and purples. I think there's a couple skeins missing. But I probably just haven't caked yet. And then the last are these like greens and golds. So one side will be like this sort of terracotta coral color to, to uh, light lavender. And then the other side will be um, deeper purple to blue to green to yellow. So it'll, it will have some sort of more like cohesiveness, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. And I also have full skeins that, um, hold on. <laughs> I have this full skein from Cashmere Treats, which is a speckly um, coral to pink, which is going on the side I'm working on now. And then I have this like blue lavender one uh, full skein that will go on the other side and then I have as I said two and a little bit more of this um, neutral speckle which is going on both sides so I've used most of one skein um, for the side I'm working on now and then these will be the two full skeins that'll go on the other side 
if that makes sense. So, I mean, and I think I'm just, cause I don't want to rip back and do like a regular repeat of the stripes. Um, instead, I'm just going to keep going with the way I'm doing it. And I may, when I get to the other side, I might choose to do a regular repeat and just see how it goes. I'm going to have to intersperse those full skeins, um, pretty frequently though, just because they are, um, uh, I'm going to need to use that yardage to make it. I, I'll know more when I finish this side, which I'm about halfway through, I would say. Um, but it is going to be so luxurious and cozy. And um, I love these colors. These are colors that I wear a lot. So uh, very, very happy to have this. And I will keep you posted. I'll give you an update next time on how this is going. It's very, it's very much a comfort knit and easy to work on. Um... Okay, I have also, I'm working on a polar bear toy. I have not made very much progress, but I'm just gonna talk to you about it really quickly. Um, this is all the, you work from the um, backside to the head, and I have not really put too much work onto this. This is for my granddaughter. My oldest son has a one-year-old um, with my daughter-in-law, and um, I was meant to see them for New Year's, and I had to change my plans due to Omicron um, flaring up, so I'll be seeing them again in March, so I really wasn't pushing myself to work on this, and she's one, so she doesn't know um, really that it's on its way at all, so it'll be a nice surprise for her whenever she gets it, uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna go back to um, working on this pretty soon I, I put a row in here and there it's a nice small easy to travel project that's what the pattern looks like it's um, by Susan B Anderson and it's called sleepy polar bear yeah. so that is another whip these are all left over from 2021 <laughs> I have a couple new cast-ons, but before I have you see those, I'm going to have you watch a video where I talk about my planning process um, and, how, and how I use my bullet journal. And when you come back, I will talk a little bit more about um, the bullet journal. Um, I've been using this since, 20, since the beginning of 2018, so, and I'm, I'm not that far in where that that's about as far in. So I'll, I'll probably have this for a decade, I'm guessing. <laughs> we'll see, unless I start using it a whole lot more. Um, but yeah, go watch that and come back and I will um, show you some more whips and talk a little bit more about the bullet journal. So I am just sitting here getting organized for 2022. I really want to cast on something new before the end of the year. And yeah, so I made a list of all the things that I want to make. Um, this is my project list from 2021. What I did last year was I listed all of the things that, all the projects that I wanted to make as I thought of them. And then I um, checked a box. I should have probably dated this. This would have been probably... But I don't know, this works because the dates are all on Ravelry for me as well. So um, this was just for my quick reference as to, you know, was it a project that I wanted to make? Did I already have the yarn? Did I cast it on? And um, did I finish it? So I circled the things that I did not finish. I This actually is not on my Ravelry. <laughs> I cast it on randomly one at one moment. Um, early in 2021 and it's with yarn I have it's just a white plain white throw a DK weight and um it's now in my languishing whip pile anyway yeah so a bunch of other things that I made over the year and things that I thought about making um, and that I have the yarn for. So this one, Saucy Surrey in the Ching Fiber Black Hair went on to my 2022 list. Oh, I'll put this over there too, a Daddy Owl. Um, yeah, so that's, so those two I didn't get to. Um, it continued over here and I have learned to not use the other side of the page, which you can see coming through there. Um, at the top of this page was a bunch of um, languishing whips. These things right, or these first five were ones that were languishing whips. Sorry, first four. <laughs> From 
before from like 2019 or 2020 and um, things that I really wanted to finish and I was able to get uh, one of those done. I finished my Christmas shifty and uh, I still have three left. These Norway shorts, a shawl um, out of Long Island Yarn and Farm and uh, a shawl design that I haven't worked on in quite a while. Um, I think about it though. <laughs> so those are going to move into my, um, hopefully to be finished in 2022. Um, yeah, so it goes on here. There was one other project that I started that I had never talked about on my channel. It was the Spark Cardi. What I did was I just cast on some sleeves at some point because I needed something mindless for a trip, like for a quick trip somewhere and I ended up like I just wanted to knit the cuffs so that's what I ended up doing so that will move on to my 2022 list and then I have a few things here that I don't know that I'm going to move over that I never got to um yeah I don't know I don't know it continues over here I had a few more um thoughts about things that I didn't get to um, and the DK half and half that I just recently put on. Sorry, this is hard to read because I wrote in, um, Sharpie markers on both sides. Anyway, here's my 2022 list. Um, I just have nine things listed so far. I'll be adding the owl, so that'll be 10. Um, but I want to make the perennial out of the Cory Worsted. These are all things I have yarn for. I want to make a thousand suns. I don't remember the name. I'll pop the pictures on screen as I think of, as I read them to. A thousand suns um, out of spin cycle and some green mountain spinnery. A scrappy throw out of knit collage and hand spun. So no image for that. It'll just be a one by one rib scrappy thing like I always make for my throws. Um, Daily pullover by Paula Pereira out of linen quill. I bought that recently. Jack Pine pullover out of um, some yarn, Bichu and Bushi, Bichu and Bouchers, uh, plus some spin cycle that I have on hand. Um, so that I bought at Rhinebeck. Spark Cardi, that's the one that I had in, from the 2021 list. I just moved it over here. A crochet basket out of scraps. I found a great free pattern, which I can't wait just to work on and show you. There's a Junko design I'm interested in making, and I've got the yarn for it. It's Brooklyn um, Tweed Shelter and some hand spun, and then the Saucy Surrey out of the uh, Ching Fiber Melted Baby Surrey. Um, yeah, so I don't know which of these to cast on. I'm thinking I should do the heavier weight ones. Um, I could just continue working on this all over color work this one is cabled that's all over color work scraps are scraps I already have a couple mindless knits on the needles that uh, I don't really want to do either of these two so I was looking for something that would be a little more interesting I could do this I'm actually thinking about gifting this so it'd probably be good to get that going yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure what to do. I made another list of yarn that I have that I want to find projects for in 2022. And I have a list of 10 different yarns. I've got a bunch of mini skeins. Um, I have some mohair and singles that match each other. They're by Chelsea Lux and this company called Acid Dye, which I don't know if that's the name of the company anymore, but I do know she's still dying because I recently looked for her and found her. I've got some... Hand spun self striping. Oh, that's the uh, Green Goat Ranch that I'm finishing up. I have some hand spun um, Mill Marl Brown from John Arbin that I love. I have some Lobby and I May Helix. I have some yarn from Boondoggle Farms. It's a their Sun Bunny um, yarn. I have some Gold John Arbin that's hand spun. I have Taconic Twist from Wing and a Prayer in like a seafoam green. I've got Jill Draper Ansel in a cobalt blue. And I have some Julie Aslan Fino that is a Rhinebeck colorway from a couple years ago that I've never done anything with, but it's really beautiful and I would love to find, figure out something to make with it. Yeah, so these are some, I just, just thought maybe doing this might help me you know, keep these on the 
in my mind as I'm trying to, as I see new projects or projects that I'm interested in making. So certainly the mini skeins I can use for those crochet baskets because I think I'm going to make crochet baskets for gifts this year. So I think I'm going to make a bunch of them and then give them away. So yeah. And then I also, besides all of this, I also have a couple sweaters quantities, probably like three or four sweaters quantity of superwash yarn. Okay. For Christmas, I gifted, I think you saw in the vlog, Mrs. I gifted my sister some socks that somebody had knit for me, but I hadn't worn. Um, and I just thought she would like them. And I thought that our feet were the same size, but it turns out she's got a bigger foot than I do. And so she had to give them back to me. And I told her I would knit her a different pair. So I've been working on the, again, using the DRK Everyday Sock Pattern, which is a toe up pattern with a flegal heel. And I'm in the heel section right now. Um, so yeah, I'm working in this, uh, sport weight yarn by Olan and, uh, it's a skein that I got in a mystery bag probably two or three years ago. This is the skein. Um, and because it's sport weight, I'm working with a slightly bigger needle than what the pattern calls for. I have a, I think I have a two point uh, 2.5 or 2.5 needle that I'm using. It's in my um, Ravelry project page or if, you, if you're if you not on Ravelry, if you can't access Ravelry, just um, ask me in the comments below or send me a, um, ask me on Instagram and I'll let you know what it is. If you are curious, I'll give you all the details. So I'm just making like a small, like one of the child size uh, in terms of the number of stitches I'm using. I'm doing 40 four stitches in the round um, on the sock and just knitting the lengths um, that to the specification of my sister's foot. So they should end up fitting her. So those are coming along. Those are kind of a nice, cool little package to take when I, you know, go out, which I haven't done much of lately. And <laughs> as you saw um, in the, uh, video clip I have cast on I have a new cast on this is the perennial sweater by Nora gone that hi, hi Mr. Mo that's my little Roro um perennial sweater by Nora gone that is in the <laughs> worsted book oh my goodness He's making this so much harder. Worsted by Amy, I think that's pronounced Gile, I'm not sure, of Lobby and Ame. Um, just came out. Whoops. Oh, sorry, buddy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and I, oh my gosh, it's going to flip closed. <laughs> I purchased Cory Worsted at uh, the Cake Wool Palooza. That was the event that was the day before Rhinebeck in October. So yeah, I purchased a sweaters quantity of this beautiful rust color. Um, I don't remember the name of this color. Let's see. Gory Worsted. Oh, Kat, Katsune? Kitsune. So she died, uh, Amy died the um, Cory Worsted. I'm probably not going to be able to get that back in with one hand. Um, she died the Cory Worsted in a lot of the colors that she has uh, in her line. And um, the wool has Gotland in it, which is a naturally gray base. So it the colors are over dyed on this grayish base and they just are beautiful. They're so rich and gorgeous. Um, yeah, so I swatched for this sweater. I have to say though, before I swatched, I had a little bit of a freak out because I looked at the pattern and it turns out that each piece is knit bottom up in pieces. So, and I don't mind doing bottom up at all. I don't mind front and back being two separate pieces, but the sleeves being in a piece, I didn't really understand. It's just a plain sleeve. I didn't understand why it's not 
knit in the round in a contiguous method. So I kind of freaked a little bit and wasn't sure I even wanted to make this sweater. I was like, oh, maybe I want to make something else. So I was looking through the book to see what else there was. And I, on the very next page, I saw this one. So, and this is by Matt, I think it's pronounced Cyril. Um, Mac, Max, Maxim Cyril, one of the Le Garçon um, partners. And um, yeah, I thought this was really pretty. And I was like, hmm, maybe I could do this. What do I have on my stash that I could knit with? So I swatched for this too. Um, this wool is, let's see if I have the tag. Oh my goodness, I thought I had the tag. Crap. All right, this wool is Wing and the Prayer, Wing and a Prayer, uh, the Happiest Yarn, and it is indigo dyed. So um, <laughs> this is gonna be now a very different type of story. I knit a very small swatch because this wool was getting blue dye all over my hands, like really, really badly, just in the amount of time that I did this. And I started to worry that perhaps the yarn that I was going to use for contrast would, it would bleed out onto it. And I realized that, and it did, this is just a swatch. So you could see like all the darker blue in there or that sort of grayish tone to the white. These were white, white. Um, so I, I ended the swatch so that I could just get right to pre-washing the skeins. So this is one of the skeins, it's still damp. I had to, I had caked this skein, so I had to rewind it um, into a skein format so that I could soak it and get the excess dye out of it. And I wish I took video of it because it turned my hands so blue, just handling it in the water. Like both hands were really, really blue. And the basin that I washed the, it in turned really, really blue. <laughs> I never worked with indigo dyed yarn before, so I didn't realize how much it bleeds. And I mean, I know that jeans bleed, blue jeans that are indigo dyed bleed, but I didn't realize that wool, this, that um, indigo dyed wool would bleed so much. So I, I have three skeins of this, which is plenty for this sweater. And I, yeah, I spent uh, about an hour you know, with letting um, moments of soaking in between washing this. And the colorway is called Blue Jeans. And I do think it lost a little bit of the blue, but I don't mind that. Like I didn't, it's a very silvery blue um, anyway. So it's like a silvery gray blue. Um, I, I'll tell you more about the yarn at another time, like at about the content of it and stuff, but it is called the happiest yarn. Um, and I am going to pair it with, I think I'm gonna pair it with this. So I think that will be really pretty. Um, this will uh, self-stripe a bit in the yoke part, which I think will be cool. And um, yeah, this is some hand spun that I, that I made. This is, technically a light worsted so I or like heavier DK weight I guess um but I did get gauge I got gauge with this one but where's the I don't know where the Cory is here it is the Cory I actually didn't get gauge I actually found it pretty interesting so Max's sweater called for 19 stitches per four inches on a size six needle. Nora's, and it's supposed to be the same yarn, right? So the whole book is supposed to be Cory Worsted. Um, Nora's was 22 stitches per 44 inches on um, size six needles. And I didn't get it. I actually have 19 stitches on size five needles. My size six is down here. So I'm gonna kind of fiddle with that um, in terms of like maybe adjusting the size that I make. But yeah, so the, yeah, I think that'll be very pretty, right? 
So this has a lot of yellow in it. And it also has like this blue um, tone. And I did, um, I'll show you, I did photograph these next to each other, the blue specifically next to the um, Wing and a Prayer Farm yarn to see if I was gonna get enough contrast. I photographed them and gray toned them to make sure they were good. Um, Cause I have another one, these are, these both are from Bats by Frost Yarns. And um, I really love this one, but the contrast isn't as good uh, with the with the wing and a prayer yarn. I mean, it might be okay, but I also really like this, so I think I'm gonna go with this. Oh, also, you might remember that I showed these. And I said that I was going to do the hiber knit along um, of Stephen West shawl with this yarn. And I had included this other one. So these are all, these are all from Frost Yarn Bats um, that I bought at different times. Um, and this is really, this ended up being a chunky worsted weight. So yeah, I was going to do the hiber knit along um, shawl pattern this year, but I changed my mind because I have two shawls on the needles right now. And, um, yeah, I'd rather do something else with this gorgeous yarn. And this sweater kind of surprised me. This is the yesteryear sweater. I've done quite a lot of knitting on this. It's a little potato chippy. Um, yeah, so this is the Yesteryear Sweater by Max, I'm going to mess up his pronunciation, and one of my viewers told me last time I said his name that the right way to say it, but do you think I remember? Mm -mm, don't remember. <laughs> um, but I want to say it's S, it's C-Y-R, Cyril, 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 Cyril maybe, I don't know. He's one of the Le Garçon um, partners. And he uh, lives in Canada, and you, you probably have heard of him. I, he, it's only, you only use two colors. I used a color changing yarn that is some of my hand spun. This is what's left. So it went from rust to this periwinkle blue to rust again, and then periwinkle blue again. So this is what's left. I think I'm gonna use uh, this yarn to do some tipping on the sleeves and on the bottom. The other yarn, actually here, I'll just use this one. The other yarn is this one. It is an indigo dyed natural yarn by Wing and a Prayer Farm. Um, it is, uh, yeah, it is gorgeous yarn. It is called the happiest yarn and it is made from, um, It is a combination of Shetland, Clune Forest, and Cormo, and it is a light worsted weight, technically, but it I got gauge just by going down, actually going down a needle size. I should have had to go up, but I went down a needle size instead, um, and I got gauge, I hit gauge. So I, I got the same gauge with this yarn that I did with um, the Cory Worsted, which is what the pattern was made for, uh, designed for. So yeah, I'm so happy with this. I actually, it's funny, I I keep thinking it looks kind of masculine, but I think, I think I'm gonna like it. I, the yarn, even after I washed it, uh, pre-washed it, it still is, is crocking quite a bit all over my hands as I knit. So my hands get very blue. It washes right off, comes right off, no problem. Um, but I'm, I'm interested in seeing what happens the next when I wet block it like whether or not that ends the bleeding I know that indigo can bleed I've never knit with knit indigo dyed yarn before though so I don't know if it's common for um, the, the color to continue to crock for you know a few wearings and stuff I'll just have to make sure I wear dark colors underneath it so that it doesn't if I wore a white t-shirt, it might potentially make it blue in places where it was rubbing, like in the armpits or around the neck and stuff. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But this has been such a joy to knit. And you'll, you'll notice that it wasn't on my list. 
Um, because I didn't know I was going to knit it. I was completely planning on knitting the perennial by Nora Gone out of the Cory Worsted, which is sitting right there. But I did kind of freak out about the fact that it was a pieced sweater. But now I have, I've thought as I've, I was good, I put it down and decided not to do it right away. Um, because now that I've been thinking about it, I know how to knit it in the round. So I'm going to knit it, knit that pattern in the round up to the armpits and then... I'm going to knit the sleeves in the round up to the armpits too. Um, and then I'll do the seaming just around the armhole. And then I'll also have a shoulder. I'll have the shoulders to seam. So that should work because it's a bottom up. That's a bottom up knit. I have decided um, to prioritize my heavier weight knits because I um, want to, I can wear them now. So those are the things that I'm reaching for, my DK weight and worsted weight sweaters. So, because it's quite cold and it will be quite cold for another six weeks or so. Um, so I'm reaching for those woolier, non-superwash, heavier weight knits for, um, for this time period. So I wanna, I wanna prioritize based on the things on my list, the either worsted or DK weight things. And I do want to prioritize the throw that I'm planning to make as well. I wanted to circle back to, I was watching the footage that I had made earlier today and I was seeing that I had a white throw that I never really talked about last year that I had cast on at some point and just like put it down and I knit maybe like that much of it. And it was one of those throws that you knit on the diagonal so you start at this point and you work your way, you know, so you're slowly increasing and then you reach a point and you start decreasing. I only had about 600 yards of this DK weight yarn. So I was thinking I'll get to halfway and then I'll start decreasing and I'll end up with this more or less like square slash rectangle shape throw. It'll be fine, it's white. I have uh, a lot of white decor in my house so it would look really great. Um, but I also talked about doing a scrappy throw out of some knit collage, which will be primarily white. And one of the things I've been lamenting about with that is that it's not enough white. Like I want a little more white in there. So I think I'm gonna combine those. So I'm gonna take that 600 yards of DK weight and somehow combine it, maybe knit two strands together so it matches the bulky weight of some of the knit collage yarns I have and the hand spuns that I'm planning to put together to make a, uh, a blanket out of. And I'm gonna make that a blanket. But um, I do think that needs to wait until I'm done with this half and half shawl or or I need to put one. They're such both mindless knits and they're both so big and have so many moving parts that I need to. This is really couch knitting, like sitting and just knitting here. Not really things that I can pack up and take anywhere easily like I can some of these other projects. So... Yeah, so I need to think about it. I may just go ahead and cast on the blanket because I know it'll. I'll have it done in a week or so, two weeks maybe at the most. Because um, I'll just do on really big fat needles. Um, I have to look to see what my other throw, what needle size I use. So I'm just going to make a one by one rib, you know, cast on whatever 60 stitches or something, and then just knit until the yarn is gone, kind of thing. So yeah, so I think I'll just put those together, and that way that. Um, scrappy blanket ends up being more white it gets more white in it which is what I really want um, yeah so I don't really want to spin a bunch of white yarn because that's kind of boring <laughs> it's boring to spin um, how am I doing oh my goodness this is going to be so long um, okay 2021 recap I like to do a little look back and see how many projects I made what those projects were and most importantly, how many yards did I knit versus how many yards of yarn did I buy? <laughs> so here we go. I knit 38,000 yards of yarn this year. Um, that was in 46 projects. So to give you a comparison for 2020, I knit 47 projects and I knit about 30,000 yards that year. So I did a little better, I knit a little more. Well, I crafted, there was one crochet project which might have helped me get over the fat, you know, cause crochet uses a lot more yarn. Um, out of those projects, what I knit was, I knit 17 sweaters for adult size sweaters. I knit two 
baby size sweaters for my granddaughter. I knit eight hats all in the last few weeks. I knit five pairs of socks and this I said I wrote that this was the year of the sock for me where I really learned about what type of sock I like to um, wear, what fits my foot well and what I like to wear. I landed on the DRK everyday sock in case you haven't noticed. I knit five shawls, one crochet shawl. I had one crochet shawl. It got me back into crocheting. I haven't crocheted since I learned how to knit. So I crocheted from age eight until like age 17 and didn't crochet any more after that um, until this past year. <laughs> I knit, I made one pair of baby knit mitts for my granddaughter and I knit six Christmas stockings. Um, the unfinished objects that I have are the two shawls that I just showed you and the polar bear toy. Um, I also tallied up what, how much yarn I spun and I'm going to share with you my latest spinning project in a couple minutes. Um, I hand spun 12,000 yards of yarn this year in a variety of weights. And of the yarn that I hand spun, I used two, two amounts, two sweaters quantities of that. So about uh, 2,500 yards. I knit into sweaters. I knit one skein into socks. And I knit, actually that's not right, I knit two skeins into socks, I just must, must not have tagged it. I also gifted quite a lot of hand spun. So I gifted about 2,000 yards of hand spun as well. Um, so I tallied it up as about 5,000 of that 12,000 yards I actually knit. That's part of the 38,000 yards that I knit my yarn purchases. So I've had quite a knitting stash since I got back into knitting, um, in 2017 or so. Like when I decided, when I, when I discovered Stephen West and I saw the way that he was, um, knitting shawls and I quite, I started to knit some of his shawl patterns and I quite enjoyed it. And I started to realize that it would be very beneficial for me to, um, be able to look at stash and, pick yarns from my stash to knit his patterns instead of trying to purchase um, yarn from all over the place to get it to go together so that it was a, it was a you know, a palette that I wanted to knit with. So that was when I kind of started to build up my stash. And so I still have quite a lot. You can see it right here behind me in this cupboard. Um, I have quite a lot of single skeins. Um, yeah, so I have been... For the past two years, I've been very intentional with my purchases, like buying yarn for a specific project um, and using stash wherever I can. Um, I did do a little bit of pandemic buying early in, in the pandemic months of 2020 where, you know, a lot of makers were struggling because the rug got pulled out from under them. So I wanted to help them and support them. So I bought some amounts of yarn knowing that, you know, this will be a sweater's quantity or a shawl's quantity, but I don't have a particular project in mind. So that's what ended up on that list. A lot of those ended up on the list, my yarn I want to use list. Um, so besides like some hand spun that I, that I made, I kind of gave myself, so I learned how to spin in 2019, in spring of 2019, and I kind of gave myself up till now, a pass on buying as much fiber as I wanted. Um, but I'm to the point, I reached the point probably in a, right after Rhinebeck, like so end of October of last year, where the, fi the plastic bins that I have my fiber in are full. And I actually have fiber that doesn't fit in those bins since Rhinebeck. So I don't want to buy any more fiber um, until I spin a significant amount of that fiber. Um, with the exception of the advent calendars, which were pre-purchased early in 2021. So those were already on their way and coming. Um, so yeah, so so in terms of my purchases for 2022, I don't have any reason to buy anything <laughs> right now. And I know a lot of this feeling is just this January 
blah feeling we get as consumers where we've just spent quite a lot of money on things for other people, gifts or things for ourselves and we've been bombarded with sales and um, feeling like we should spend and you know whatever, bye bye bye. Um, so I know part of that is just sort of that spending hangover that happens every January, but also just like doing those calculations of how much did I knit versus how much did I buy? I haven't quite said what I bought yet. So I bought 31,000 yards of yarn in 2021. I knit 38,000. That would be fine, except that I also spun 12,000. So um, basically, we have a problem here. I have have more yarn now at the end of 2021 than I did at the end of 2020, and I don't want that to be the case. I would prefer to have less. So I um, am going to be very, very careful. I will be buying Advents again this year, and those might be the only purchases I make. I do have some pre-orders. I mean, ideally, that would be the only purchases that I make, and I knit from my stash and all of that jazz. Um, I hope I can maintain that. Um, I do have some pre-orders, some things that I pre-ordered that weren't due to ship until this year. So I pre-ordered in 2021 and they're coming now. They're coming in the next couple months. So I have, I think I have five different things coming, different orders that'll be coming. So that stuff is coming. Um, and other than that, I am going to try really hard to use my sash course I know a lot of people are saying that so it's not really a resolution I don't really like resolutions because it's too easy to fall off your resolution but I do really really want to try to use up some of the gorgeous yarns that I have um, in my stash I also have realized that um, I prefer non-superwash yarns I prefer to wear sweaters knit out of non-superwash versus superwash Superwash, it's interesting. Like, I can definitely feel a, a difference in the warmth factor. Non-superwash is warmer than superwash. Um, so I, superwash can be really great for transitional seasons for me. Um, so for that, you know, spring to summer and fall to winter season, and even in summertime, in the cooler nights or days of summer, they could be quite nice. Superwash can be quite nice. Uh, but I really do appreciate the cozy warmth of non-superwash much, much more. And those are the sweaters that I reach for. So I want to be cognizant of that as well. And a lot of the yarns that I have um, either spun myself or collected are non-superwash, like collected sweater quantities with this idea that I'm going to make something with this because it's such gorgeous yarn. I've got to make something with it. Um, yeah, so, so that is my plan we'll see what happens um i also somewhere in december ended up doing a deep dive into thoughts people's thoughts on reddit if you've ever looked at reddit the blogging platform it, you can really go down a reddit hole and you know come up like i went i ended up on some knitter threads on reddit and i didn't really fully understand why talking about stash is so controversial until I read some of these Reddit threads and what I realized is that it makes people, some people, feel like they also need that. Like, so it's almost like a commercial even though that's not the intent. Like, that's not my intent when I'm talking to you all about what I bought. I'm not trying to encourage you to buy, but it can come off that way. Like, the impact can be that people feel like they also must have that yarn. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, I not kind of but definitely interesting and uh what i can tell you is that you probably you will see a lot of beautiful yarn here but you won't see a lot of purchasing here i don't think especially not in the short term um the first few months of the year anyway other than those pre-order things that i talked about and they're all coming sporadically it's sporadically different times i think at the earliest i'm getting stuff in february and then probably a lot of it in march or even april um so yeah, there won't be much of that. You will see a lot of really pretty yarns that I purchased before now as I am casting on new projects though. 
so yeah, I thought, um, I just wanted to share that with you. And, um, that is not the same as what happened to me in, for the end of 2020. At the end of 2020, I actually knit more yardage than I purchased. So I, oh no, wait, no, I didn't. I knit about 30,000 and purchased 33,000. Um, I did a lot of de-stashing though in, um, 2020 I de-stashed about 35 skeins of yarn so that made emptied my stash out quite a bit because I Advent spin project that I had been working on all of December and I promised to show you the uh, yarn in this first episode. Um, this was an eight-day Advent from Green Goat Ranch and, it, and she called it her Watercolor Bright um, series. So this is a, I ended up making four skeins. I have two completed I have a third one that's um, been plied and I just need to wind it up and soak it, do the last bits of finishing process for it. And I have one on the, um, on the machine right now. This is my second skein, which I think you can see it's open. So I think you can see the striping. You can see the chunks of color. So I spun this in such a way that um, when you knit it, it will very definitely self stripe in wide bands of color. I don't know how many yards exactly I ended up with, but um, this is pretty much the color repeat right here. I think this would need to kind of fan out and there is like a purpley pink in there. So yeah, that would be, this would, this will be the color repeat. Let me just push that purple pink forward. There we go. So there is red on either side, but this, the red on, uh, one side is more orangey red and then the red on the other side has hot pink in it um, So if I were to knit the skeins consecutively There would be a pretty wide um, Band of red so it would be red orange to red pink and then um, finishing out the rest of the colors um, It's interesting. I the way that Sarah I spun them in the order in which I got them um, I figured out within uh, the first couple days with this first color, so this was day one, and the orange and yellow day two, this green day three, this blue day four, this purple day five, this one day six, this yellow day seven, and this red was day eight. Um, I figured out pretty quickly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted self-striping, and uh, I also... Um, knew I did the math of how much fiber I was getting and figured out pretty fast that I would end up with four full skeins. Um, the weight of the yarn tends to, has, uh, I would call it um, sport weight. I think it might be even a light DK. Um, I was aiming for fingering weight, but I wasn't sure what was gonna happen when, in the soak. And in the soak, the yarn really bloomed. So it really um, just became much more lofty, which I, I'm not mad about at all. I actually love it. I'm quite happy with the way it came out. Um, I have, I think I'm gonna have about 1300 yards or so, which is plenty for a sizable project, or I could um, make several smaller projects um, because already what I'm thinking is that this would just be so beautiful for my granddaughter. <laughs> yeah. So I want to think about like what, um, what type of pattern might be really cool for her with, um, you know, one or two skeins I can imagine. So maybe I'll make her something, a sweater, a pullover or something. I would love to do something like the weekender that uh, Andrea Mowry designed a couple years back, but for a child. So maybe there's a way I can um, 
I don't know, maybe rework that pattern. Maybe there's something, maybe like Tin Can Knits has something, like a really simple, I just want to make like a simple pullover or something, or maybe a cardigan for her. Um, but I can't imagine I would need more than two skeins um, for, for, my, for my little one. So we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, aren't these fun? These are so fun. That was uh, such a fun spin. And it's coming to an end, which is, you know, all things must. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to spinning some some of the fiber that I have sitting over there that I got at uh, Rhinebeck slash, you know, pre-orders of stuff um, from the towards the end of last year. Not to mention all of the fiber that are sitting in plastic bins over there in the off-screen closet um yeah so it's time to um spend those things and i think what i've realized is instead of trying to think of a project and then spin i should just spin um and that's pretty much what i did this past year i just spun whatever moved me and i think it worked i think it worked I have one more segment. Um, last year in 2021, I spent some time in my final segment talking about lifestyle stuff. Um, this year, I, um, I'm just gonna grab my bullet journal because I did give myself some notes in there about, uh, about this segment. Um, this year, I've wanted to talk about, and there seemed to be some interest in um, talking about allyship. Um, what does it mean to be a good ally? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today just because I, I actually all these segments, the lifestyle segments are five minutes or less. So I'm going to spend like two or three minutes just talking about allyship and what it is and what, what my plan is. And then uh, we'll really get more into it next time. Um, but I will give you something to do if you're interested in becoming a better ally or you want to work on your allyship. Um, it, this is something that um, the area that I'm in, the academic area that I'm working in as an administrator and as an um, instructor, I have been, me and my colleagues have been circling around this idea of allyship um, because one of the things that we realized after George Floyd was murdered that was that there's a lot of people who don't even know what it means to be a good ally. Um, so it's something that we, some curriculum that we're um, looking to design. And my thought was for my viewers, I could bring a couple of those um, lessons, maybe break them into small chunks, into kind of little mini lessons or mini little chats, two or three minute chats, and just tell you um, some useful tips and thoughts about what it means, what allyship is and what it means to be a good ally. Um, because if no one tells you, you're not going to know. Um, it's not, you'd have to go seek out information on how to be a good ally and, um, um, what it means. And, you know, generally speaking, like just speaking about human interaction in general, people will always tell you what they want. They always tell you what they want. So people, if we're talking about um, white people being good allies to people of color or like um, straight people being good allies to gay people or, you know, whatever, or men being good allies for women, um, the, the, the people that you're trying to ally with, that you're trying to be a good ally to, will tell you what they need. Uh, just listen. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Um, but sometimes that's not enough for some people. Some people don't hear it unless other folks point out to them, this is what this looks like. And that's okay because we're all learning. Everybody is coming from a different place and starting in a different place with this information. So um, the first thing that I just want to talk about, like in order to even begin the trip or the journey to to become a, an, a good ally, no matter what you're trying to ally yourself with, whether it's people of color or um, people that aren't cisgender, which means you're not, you're, you're not uh, heterosexual, you're, you know, some other form of sexuality. 
Um, or you're trying to, al- or you're a man trying to ally yourself with um, women, and you want to be a good feminist ally, um, or whatever. There might be some other allyship criteria or things that I haven't thought of. The very first thing is that you need to acknowledge that there's a problem. Um, so if you are not ready to acknowledge there's a problem, then there might be that you need, there's, there, it requires acceptance that something's wrong. <laughs> so that's the very first thing. Um, so if you're not sure if something's wrong and when it comes to things like all of those issues that I talked about, probably the easiest one to swallow is probably straight to gay, right? Being a straight ally for gay people is probably, I would guess for the, in this time, that that might be the easiest one to swallow. Because the other two that I named, the sexism and racism, those two are harder because we don't want to acknowledge that there's actually even a problem because that requires us to do something. And maybe we're not in a good space at this point in time in our own lives, in our own journey to actually acknowledge that there's a problem because we don't have the energy to do anything. And that's okay. You, you, are, you are walking your own path and that path may or may not have obstacles and other things that you need to deal with. Like if someone had talked to me about being a good ally when I was going through the early days of my divorce and I was just becoming a single parent of a one-year-old and a four-year-old, I couldn't have I didn't have the bandwidth for talking about allyship. I was barely putting one foot in front of the other at that point in time in my life. So I understand it's not, maybe not everyone's prepared, but if you are prepared, great. This series, (laughs) this little, you know, last couple minutes of each of my episodes is going to be for you. You're going to enjoy this, I think. And you're, and I hope you'll learn something. I hope you'll, some of the stuff you might already know, but I'm starting from the bottom. Like I'm starting at base level stuff so that we can all get, get, you know, move together, progress together as, you know, and learn together. I'm learning too. So I want to start with that as well. I want to just say, I'm also learning. These are things like some things I can't believe it took me this many years, like I'm in my 50s to get to this point to realize some of these things. Like, again, I think just talking about the level of discomfort that we have about talking about sexism and racism, both of those things. So I'm mostly going to be, I mean, allyship can take many forms. So um, both of those things are things that were, there was a lot of noise about in the 60s and 70s. Like there was a lot of coverage in the U.S. anyway, mostly speaking about U.S. perspective, because I don't know other country perspectives. Um, But in the U.S., there was a lot of noise about those things in the 60s and 70s. And then it, it just sort of seemed like it all went away. No one talked about it anymore because we were done, right? But that wasn't what happened. The, the oppression of women, the oppression of people of color just went underground. That's what happened. And people weren't talking about those things um, anymore, but they were still happening. And they're still happening today, 40 years after those movements. And it's troubling, that part is troubling. So I'm hoping that, at least to me, it's troubling. I hope it's troubling to you. I'm hoping that what I can talk to you about will help us work through some of those things. And I will be um, sharing resources as we go, things that you can look at um, on your own and absorb on your own and things that you might want to, you know, read over and over. I want to share two books and then I'm going to end this with some beautiful footage of some snow and I saw the fox again. So you'll see the fox again. Um, But he was, there. it was one, only one and, and it was quite far away. Um, so two of the books that I'm reading currently is this one. This is 
What's Up With White Women. It's written by two white women. It's unpacking sexism and white privilege. So those two things, those two things that are bound together often um, in the pursuit of social justice. So I'm reading this and I'm also reading, I don't have it because it's, an, I'm listening to it actually, it's an audio book. That's what it is. The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together by Heather McGee. So let me just show you. Hopefully you can see. There you go. So I am making my way through this book. It is so good. I think as soon as I'm done, I'm going to go back to the beginning and listen to it again. Um, it, Heather McGee is an economist who, um, she is African-American descent and she is talking about the history of um, this country and how racism colors a lot of the policies and um, standards that we have, the, and how racism is embedded in all of those things. Um, and it is so amazing and so eye-opening. I do, I am nodding along with her, crying along with her, laughing with her. It's really, really good. Um, of course, both of these are nonfiction, and I know that's also like sort of a thing that not everyone has the bandwidth for, but I highly recommend both of these. Um, as I said, the uh, What's Up With White Women, um, actually the only reason that I have this as a hard copy is because I believe I'm going to, I'm planning to, well, I haven't read um, a lot of it yet, but I'm thinking that there's probably some really salient chapters in here that I will be having my class read. Uh, so yeah. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful next couple weeks. Um, I, oh, I do have a special episode planned that will be out of, uh, it'll, it won't, I'm just going to tell you the title. You know how last year I did Knitter's Life, the Rhinebeck episode? This is going to be, so it wasn't a number. And then I went and resumed the numbering. Um, this is going to be Knitter's Life, the Moth episode <laughs> because I had trouble with moths in 2021 and I need to talk about it. Um, I learned a lot. I made myself like a good, you know, professor does. I made myself a whole bunch of notes um, so that I could remember in case this ever happens to me again. So I want my, I, my, it may be my next episode. I may do the moth episode next, but it'll be out of sequence. It won't be episode two or three. It'll be the moth episode. So that's coming. But yeah, that's where I'm at. I hope you enjoyed. I am so grateful for each and every one of you. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy that you um, chose to spend some time with me. I love reading your comments. Uh, I read each and every one, even if I don't reply to all of them. I apply. I reply to most of them. I give you at least a heart. So you know that I read it. Um, unless some just completely get away from me, which does happen occasionally when my life gets busy. So, um, but anyway, I look forward to sharing more with you this year. I hope you're having a wonderful start to 2022. I hope we have, I mean, it feels hopeful and I, you know, to me, I hope you also feel hopeful as well. Enjoy the winter footage that I'm about to insert here and uh, including the deer and the fox. Actually, did I, no, just fox for the for the outro, the intro had the deer. And I will see you next time. Take care. Bye.